Good morning. I am doing the announcements. Yippee-i-o, Kaye. Okay. First thing is we'd like to do the preview for Deep Poetic Journey into Something. It's the production that we're opening on this Friday at St. John's. It's Friday, Saturday, uh, 7 p.m. 7 yeah, 7 p.m. and 1.30 on the Sunday Saturday matinee. Amazing group of young people. It's really worth your while to come and see it and support them. There's other people involved too, but they're old hat. Anyways. Okay. Oh, I can see it there. song out there somewhere about boxes. Little boxes. You know, you have your popular box, your jock box, and then you have a box for people who don't know what box they fit in. I guess I'm one of those people. I try to communicate with her, talk to her, but it's like everything I do or say is wrong. Hello, I'm Mrs. Haight. I started off as a kindergarten teacher, but now I'm a school guidance counselor. Oh, not hate spelled like that. I'm not that hate. I'm this hate here. Next Sunday, September 8th, will be Sunday, Sunday. I think everyone knows what that means. After the service, we'll be serving ice cream and toppings and all sorts of things, generously donated by Catherine. Also, there will be a cake. <laughs> Kitchens, campfire, Wednesdays here in the back, 7 to 9. Bring your own chairs, snacks, and a friend for fun and fellowship. 2-H, Helping Hands, meeting Tuesday, September 3rd at 10 a.m. Basically looking, forward for looking at what next year's events will be, preparing for this year's Christmas Bazaar. Uh, dinner and dessert auction will be October 11th at 6 p.m. Uh, looking for bakers, helpers. Tickets will be on sale, or not yet. So tickets will be on sale then? Thank you. Tickets will be available from Catherine today, $20 each. Fall cleanup, November 9th, 10 a.m., followed by a chili, can I say it's a competition, Ch chili bake-off. We will have contestants, and you'll be voting for the winner, and there will be a prize for the best-rated chili. Uh, Christmas Bazaar, November 16th, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., more details to follow. Next week's food bank, it's the letter C. Good letter. <laughs> September 15th is the volunteer fair and the bring a friend to celebrate, uh, basically bring a friend. Celebrate all the ministries here, uh, get a chance to see what the ministries have done and if maybe you'd like to become involved with something new. The meet and greet is not, I repeat, not starting on September whatever it says on the slide. Does it say it somewhere here? September 4th. Will not be starting. It will be coming soon, but not this Wednesday. Please don't come. <laughs> uh, June Robinson is starting an emergency prayer chain. Basically, uh, there's a sign-up sheet that will be available from June. If you're interested in receiving emails about parishioners and members of the community that need immediate prayers, sign up and June will be on top of that and you will get an email. You are staying for coffee, aren't you, June? I guess so. Good. Good. Are there any other announcements? 
Okay, we begin this service with the acknowledgement that the land on which we gather is the traditional ter territory of the Abishnabi peoples and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, covered by the Niagara Purchase Treaty number 381 of 1781. The Father brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name's Dan Bennett, and I'm the rector. Um, it feels like I've been away forever. Um, I'm just going to do this while the, the techie folks check the, uh, the volume for the microphone. I'm getting thumbs up, so good. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, before we get started, a word of thanks to uh, Gary and June and Father David for doing such a fine job. I saw some terrific sermons and and thank you for tackling important um, questions that the church faces and my goodness david five sermons over the course of one service you brave soul you um, but you've opened a door <laughs> stay stay tuned <laughs> uh not today <laughs> It's great to be, it was a, a lovely vacation, and it's great to be back um, uh, with you. Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
joining in the collect appointed for today, let us pray. Author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us in all goodness, and of your great mercy, keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Good morning. The reading this morning is from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Discover what the Spirit is saying to the church. Today's psalm is Psalm 45. We'll do it alternately by the half verse followed by the psalm prayer. My heart is stirring with a noble song. Let me recite what I have fashioned for the king. My tongue shall be in heaven's children. You are the fairest of men. Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you. All your garments and fragrant with myrrh, fragrant with myrrh aloes, and cassa. King's daughters stand among the ladies of the court. On your right hand is the queen, adorned with the gold of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, your love unites heaven and earth in a new festival of gladness. Lift our spirits to learn the way of joy that leads us to your banquet hall, where all is golden with praise. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from James. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits for his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, Rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. 
If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Discover what the Spirit is saying to the church.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The, please be seated. The, uh, our technicians have asked me to use this microphone. And I do what they tell me. Recently, I was seated with some folks around a table, and apropos of nothing we were talking about, one person wanted to ask me a question about the church. I don't suppose it will surprise you to know that in my line of work, that happens from time to time. This person wasn't very familiar with the Anglican Church and its teachings, and I was asked what the church's position was on abortion. For just a heartbeat, the thought raced through me that this was the sort of question I better get right. Then I was calm, because I was pretty sure I knew this. I said that I have never been given an instruction to either endorse nor condemn abortion, but that I have been taught that as a church, our position to be to do our level best to comfort and support a family and its members when faced with such a difficult situation. We should acknowledge that it is a difficult situation, one in which the counsel of a doctor should be included. I then went on to admit that might sound like a non-answer. It might seem to be a safe, non-committal kind of answer that belonged somewhere in the middle of the road. And then I said that was where the Anglican Church finds itself on many issues. I gave a little bit of history. Coming out of the Reformation, Anglicans self-identified as the via media, the middle way. Between the Roman Catholic Church and the Reformers, to be nestled between opposing extreme views on a subject was familiar ground for an Anglican. And then someone brought up what has been warmly referred to as the three-legged stool of Anglicanism, that being scripture, tradition, and reason. When wrestling with an issue, this is where the Anglican looks for guidance and authority. Three sturdy legs providing a secure foundation upon which the faithful can stand, but only if they're only if they are all three considered, for without any one, the other two are not enough to provide stability. Scripture, tradition, and reason, each one informing the other two, and each one examined through the lenses of the other two. I mention all of this because we hear in our readings today a little bit about tradition and a little bit about Scripture. In our gospel reading, Jesus is being confronted by the Pharisees and the scribes. By the way, we're, we're back in the gospel of Mark. We've had a five-week departure and spent it working through the sixth chapter of John. For the next while, we'll mostly be back in Mark. Jesus talks to a lot of people, teaches the disciples, heals a blind man, and just before we move into Advent, he brings his friends to the temple. Today... Scribes and Pharisees are asking Jesus about his friends eating without washing their hands. At this point, you might be asking yourself, just what is the rule about washing your hands and where would we find it? Someone might want to know if I looked something like that up. Of course I did. I'm a nerd about this, this kind of thing. The reference is in Exodus, chapter 30. It begins at verse 17 and only continues until verse 21. It is in a part of the text where God is explaining to Moses in exacting detail the tabernacle that is to be made with the altar and what the priests are supposed to wear and what the ceremony is for ordaining the priests and what animals will be sacrificed and how and in what order. The, this part of Exodus is very specific in its content. By the time you get to chapter 30, verse 17, 
we read that there is to be a basin between the tent of meeting and the altar with water in it for the priest to wash their hands and their feet when they come to offer sacrifices. So at first blush, it looks like the instruction is for priests to wash their hands before coming to the altar. This is where it's helpful to remember the Hebrew history. The rules about the tabernacle came almost 500 years before the temple was built. And the temple stood for almost 400 years. Then came the exile. There was no temple. There was no tabernacle. But the people still wanted to be faithful. They still wanted to follow the rules. This is when they may have started to think of the family table in the home as the substitute for the table in the tabernacle and the temple. This was where they could offer their thanksgivings to God. And if there was a rule that the priests had to wash their hands before coming to the table to sacrifice, it's reasonable to conclude that the people would feel they should wash their hands before coming to the table to pray. It looks like the old customs went through a revision because of circumstances forced the people to adopt to their new situation. A new tradition was born. By the time anyone was following Jesus, the authorities would have had generations of practice telling everyone that this was how they had always done it. Notice that Jesus doesn't even mention hand washing. He goes to another piece of scripture. He quotes Isaiah from the time before the temple was destroyed. And maybe he's hoping the Pharisees will make a connection this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. At the time, the people were acting like they were being absolutely faithful, and that's how it was being packaged to the people. But they were following human traditions that had developed over the years. Their understanding was this was the same as being faithful. The thing is, these human traditions are things we have developed over time. They come from us, and as Jesus says, it is the things that come out of us that can defile us. Now, let me be very clear, Jesus didn't say that everything that comes from us will defile us. And he doesn't suggest such a thing. Where I think this leads us is back to that three-legged stool I mentioned earlier. We have tradition informed by scripture but it needs to be scrutinized through the lens of reason. This is right about where we listen for the voice of James in his letter. Are we being hearers of the word or actually doers? Those who only hear the word, as he said, deceive themselves. I suppose it's not hard to imagine they can deceive others, given the opportunity. The Anglican Church has been around for more than 500 years now. We've developed an impressive list of traditions in our time, and I have to admit that there is quite a list of traditions that have been discarded over the years. We're not so strict about when we can have a baptism, and they don't happen privately on a Sunday afternoon anymore. We're not so picky about who can get married and who's allowed to receive communion. The altar is out from the wall. And these changes aren't all new. I noticed something that I had never really paid much attention to before. The tradition was that when you built a church, the altar went at the east end of the building. Worship was in the morning and everyone would be facing the rising sun as God's creation welcomed the coming of a new day. We have three Anglican churches in Greater Fort Erie, and all three of them have the altar at the west end of the building. <laughs> I don't want to walk away and give the impression that I dismiss tradition. It's one of the legs on that stool. We don't have stability without it. 500 years we've been at this. We really should give ourselves credit for getting it right sometimes. And we have. Yes, we, we've changed the criteria, but we still baptize to bring people into the body of Christ. And we still join those committed to one another in love in the bonds of holy matrimony. 
We still bless bread and wine together. We still gather and pray with and for each other and for a world that desperately needs our prayers. But even these deeply held traditions are examined under the light of scripture and reason. For to do otherwise would be to follow tradition without question. That puts us a very short stride from divorcing ourselves from any responsibility for our actions. We would only be following orders. But if our traditions stand up to scrutiny, and we see that they do, in fact, help us to be doers of the word and not just hearers, that they appeal to our intellect and our logic, and we find that our relationship with God, with our neighbors, and with ourselves is nourished, fortified, sustained, then I think we can honestly say that we are being faithful. One last thing before I finish. The last time we had these readings was 2021. We were still deep under the influence of the pandemic. Lots of folks were still getting sick and we were taking precautions. Sometimes traditions come out of extraordinary circumstances and there is no middle way about it. It's still a good idea to wash your hands. God love you. Amen. And let us confess our faith as we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Today's prayers of the people are number four in the Green Book of Alternative Services, page 113. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray for all who confess the name of Christ. Fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray for those whose lives are bound in mutual love and for those who live in celibacy. Be their joy and their strength. Lord, hear and have mercy. For all in danger, for those who are far from home, prisoners, exiles, victims of oppression. Grant them your salvation. Lord, hear and have mercy. For all who are facing trials and difficulties, for those who are sick, today we remember those in our bulletin and we remember Sean. and those who are dying. Show them your kindness and mercy. Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray for one another, 
May we always be united in service and love. Hear and have mercy. We pray to be forgiven our sins and set free from all hardship, distress, want, war, and injustice. Lord, hear and have mercy. May we discover new and just ways of sharing the goods of the earth, struggling against exploitation, greed, or lack of concern. May we all live by the abundance of your mercies and find joy together. Lord, hear and have mercy. May we be strengthened by our communion with all Christ's saints. Lord, hear and have mercy. Let us pray. Eternal God, you create us by your power and redeem us by your love. Guide and strengthen us by your Spirit that we may give ourselves today in love and service to one another and to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, against what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I invite you to share that peace.
joining together in the prayer over the gifts. Merciful God, receive all we offer you this day. Give us grace to love one another, that your love may be made perfect in us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As always, thank you for your patience when we're dealing with technical issues, things of this world that Anyway, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks. It is right to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, sustainer of the universe. You are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be the vast expanse of interstellar space galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and have their being. Glory, Glory to you forever and ever. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the stewards of creation. Glory, Glory to you forever and ever. But we turn against you and betray your trust, and we turn against one another, Again and again you call us to return. Through the prophets and sages you reveal your righteous law. In the fullness of time you sent your son, born of a woman, to be our savior. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. By his death he opened to us the way of freedom and peace. Glory, Glory to you forever and ever. Therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Blessed are you, Lord our God, for sending us Jesus the Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, gave it to his friends, and said, take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper he took the cup of wine, he said, he gave you thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Glory to you forever and ever. Gracious God, we recall the death of your son, Jesus Christ, we proclaim his resurrection and ascension, and we look with expectation for his coming as Lord of all the nations. We who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit now bring you these gifts. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this offering of your church, that we who eat and drink at this holy table may share the divine life of Christ our Lord. Glory to you forever and ever. Pour out your spirit upon the whole earth and make it your new creation. Gather your church together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom where peace and justice are revealed. That we, 
with all your people of every language, race, and nation may share the banquet you have promised through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ. All honor and glory are yours, creator of all. Glory to you forever and ever. I am the bread of life, says the Lord. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who trust in him. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
joining in the prayer after communion. Let us pray. Almighty God, you renew us at your table with the bread of life. May your holy food strengthen us in love and help us to serve you in each other. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And we want to welcome folks who are watching online. Uh, John and Sandy White, and Pam Russell Skinner, welcome and thank you. Kathy and Pat Koch, good morning. And uh, Ken and Bev Sleeper are joining us online. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who um, connects through the course of the week um, in a, whatever schedule meets your needs. We're glad that we can be part of your week and uh, wish you every blessing. Now, I'd invite the congregation to be seated for just a moment or two because, as you know, we have the Asket Basket at the back of the church. And the problem with uh, inviting people to ask questions is they'll take you up on the offer. And over the past few weeks, we've, we've got a couple, three uh, questions that were um, deposited. Uh, the first one, um, how are the readings chosen? There's uh, what's called the Revised Common Lectionary, which uh, developed over a period of years that actually uh, came out of uh, the Second Vatican Council back in the 60s, and a new lectionary was developed, and then other churches uh, gave their input, and over the span of a couple of decades, in the early 90s, um, we settled on the Revised Common Lectionary, and a lot of your mainline churches uh, use the same uh, lectionary, a three-year cycle. Um, prior to that, the readings were in the Book of Common Prayer, and every year you'd have the same rota of readings. And, um, and now we have this, this three-year schedule. And in fact, I'm already in the process of uh, looking at the, the readings for next year because there are some choices to be made. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's how the readings, thank you for the question. Some of the hymns we sing strike me as, quote, depressing instead of, quote, joyful or praising. Am I just reading it wrong? Uh, for example, uh, quote, this from lyrics from one of our hymns, time is now fleeting, the moments are passing, passing from you and from me, shadows are gathering, deathbeds are coming, coming for you and for me. I think it's fair to say that our hymns reflect our theology and we don't just um, happy clappy our way through life, know, knowing that there are times and that God is with us, and this is something for which we give thanks, that God is with us in good times and in bad times. And in order to do that, you have to acknowledge that there are bad times. And so why would not we have hymns that reflect that sometimes we're sad, we're grieving, uh, life is hard, and yet God does not abandon us. Um, and so in that, there is hope. And, and our theology adequately uh, ref is reflected in our hymns. Um, and so we choose hymns sometimes that do sound, quote, depressing instead of joyful or praising. Um, because... That's life, folks, and we're not here to sugarcoat it. Um, and then, <clears throat> how do you discern the voice of God in our lives? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome back, yeah. Um, first of all, it gives me great... Um, hope and confidence in you because you had the 
presence of mind to ask the question. And that's what's important. Wanting to know that you're hearing the voice of God. That first chapter of James from which the, the second reading came is a good place to, to find some, some grounding, some scriptural grounding that you can then, you know, look at through the lenses of tradition and reason. Um, and you have to know that the voice of God is, is not depending on what you expect. I'm sure you know the story of the man who lived by the river and, and there was a, a message that came on the radio that the river was going to rise and the town was going to be flooded and he thought, well, you know, I'm a faithful person. I pray regularly. God loves me and I know that God will save me. Well, the river started rising and it came up, up his front walk and it started to... Um, come up the side of the house and the river was getting deeper and deeper and the water was getting higher and higher and pretty soon the fire department came by with one of those zodiac boats that they've got and the megaphone hey mister um, get in the boat we'll take you to safety no thank you very much boys but I'm a faithful person I pray regularly God loves me and I know that God will save me well the water kept rising and rising and pretty soon he had to climb out onto his roof and um, uh, the Coast Guard came along with a helicopter and they called down to him. We'll lower a ladder, climb on, and we'll take you to safety. Thank you just the same, but I'm a faithful person. I say my prayers regularly. I know God loves me and God will save me. Well, the river rose and the current was too much and it swept him away and he drowned. And up at the gates of heaven, he was furious. And he demanded an audience with the Creator. And he said, I was faithful all my life. I tried my best to do the, the, the best and live a good life. I said my prayers regularly. Why did you let me die? And God said, I sent a radio signal, a boat, and a helicopter. What the hell are you doing here? <laughs> the voice of God is not always a miracle. God works through us. And when something feels right, it feels true, it feels good then you can pretty much bank that there is God in it. Um, listen for the, the voice of God. Um, lastly, Shakespeare, Hamlet, Polonius to his son who was going off to university, this above all, to thine own self be true. The things that you've been taught here, will serve you well. Thank you for the question. All right. <laughs> yeah, so maybe there is room for five sermons in one service. <laughs> if you'll stand, let's have uh, a blessing and carry on with Sunday. Hold fast to your faith that it may move you to act with integrity and promote justice, to choose kindness and dare to love. The blessing of God Almighty, Holy Creator, Christ, and Spirit be with you and work through you among those whom you love today and always. Amen.
We are Christ's disciples, living God's word, doing God's work among all people. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.